This video is about a very unique martial art. Martial art I started training when I was quite young and started training it as I was learning Filipino martial arts. It kind of just came into the scene. I didn't know what it was and I kind of fell in love with it at the time. And I've continued training it on and off for most of my life. So stay tuned and we're going to jump right into it. Pow, pow. Inside, inside fighting, yeah. Dangerous, dangerous martial arts. Pow, pow. Ooh, ah. So the martial art I am talking about is called Silat. Silat is a very unique martial art. It is an Indonesian martial art. But saying the word Silat in itself doesn't necessarily mean anything. There are many forms of Silat. It's kind of like saying karate. And this is something that a lot of people don't get when you say karate. There's multiple different kinds of karate and they each have their own influence. I would argue that the differences with silat are even more extreme. The differences between something like a Harry Mouse silat Penjak silat So I'm going to jump in it from my perspective of the multiple different ones I've come into contact with. I've come into contact with Penjak Silat, Kuntal Silat. I've watched a lot of uh, Sufyan Beladiri Silat and I know Harimau Silat. So kind of a wide spectrum there, but they all have certain things that are in common. Now my experience with Silat is I was training Filipino martial arts. I was roughly 14 years old. I loved everything about Filipino martial arts, but I found that I wanted to focus sometimes more on empty hand because there was always such a split between the weapon and empty hand. And so some days I was like, you know what? It would be very cool if I could go to a place that had complex movements, that had all this, this kind of unique stuff that I find in Filipino martial arts, but that was more hand centric. And then there was this guy who came into the class, he'd been training with us for a while, and he started doing a lot of what you see in Filipino martial arts, but it continued. It didn't stop after the first two movements, it continued into like catching the forehand, into a grab, into a trip. I was like, oh, what is that? And he goes, oh, it's Silat. Turned out that I would end up training Kuntau Silat with Randall Goodwin. And right away, I've seen a lot of criticism about Silat. People say, oh, well, you know, like it doesn't work in a fight, it doesn't work in this, it doesn't work if you take it out on the street. One thing I'll say about Randall, and he's one of Uncle Bill's guys, is these guys were the real deal. I would not want to fight with Randall Goodwin. I'd say this as a combat sports athlete. It's been years since I've seen, seen him. I mean, he was just back then, he was so tough. And uh, I mean, I have some crazy stories with him. I'm scared to share them because he might come after me. But there are definitely some really, really crazy stories. Me and my brother ended up training at his house in his backyard privately on concrete and he would like launch us on this concrete. It was very rough training, but it gave me a very good insight into Silat, the culture behind it, the mentality behind it. And Kuntao Silat is unique in the sense that it has some Chinese influences, but it also very much looked at many other forms of Silat within itself. So I got an expression of many different styles of Silat from Randall. I jumped right into it and here are my thoughts on Silat. And I'm going to give a lot of deep insights because I think it's very unique and I'm actually going to break this down in a way that if you do Silat, I think this might be a very unique way for you to look at it. And if you don't do Silat, maybe this will motivate you to do Silat. Or maybe you'll hate Silat after this. How do I want to break down Silat? If you look at Filipino martial arts, there's a lot of very cool, dirty boxing techniques. I've talked about this and the movements there are what I would call the in-between of what an actual boxer and a Silat guy would look like. It's kind of like a simplified boxing version of Silat. They'll parry the hand down, they'll hit, they'll trap, parry, hit, but they're not really continuing the motion forward into a continuous stream of, of you know, the parry, the check, the elbow, the, the elbow here, then trapping the arm, then continuing, continuing, continuing. Now, right away, I know people are gonna say, yeah, that's cool, that, but when you look at Belladiri Silat, or you look at Kuntao, or Penjak, it looks choreographed, and when you look at their competitions, that doesn't actually happen. So what I will say is, it doesn't matter if it happens or not, it gives you a lot of hand awareness. The type of training you get at Silat, and this is point number one, will give you incredible awareness of the person's hands and how to play with their hands, which if you're a boxer, if you're a Muay Thai guy, whatever you are, it will complement your style greatly. The hand tapping, and the hand awareness in Silat, especially what I call forehand awareness. Now, what is forehand awareness? Forehand awareness is you deal with the hand coming at you, right? So I might parry the hit here, and then right away I'm already reaching out and trapping or tapping your far arm and keeping it in place before you even hit. 
I'm aware of your free hand. Whereas in boxing, you might parry, you're still aware of that hand, but you're weaving or, or you're coming in tighter. Here, you're actually trying to control it before it even moves. You're trying to just right away jam the arm. Danny Nasanto does this very well. I used to train at Guru Dance School in Marina Del Rey. He has a very unique style of silat as well because he has so many influences. But what you'll find is almost every single silat guy has incredible forehand awareness. It's something that's never talked about in martial arts, but it's a very unique thing. Which leads me to the next part, which I find is very unique to silat. Silat, again, almost every single one I've trained has a division in the body. If you were to take a line and draw it straight down my body, and I were to put my arm out, there's an outside line and an inside line. You're either gonna fight me inside or you're gonna fight me outside. Now, boxing has this, it's called outside fighting, inside fighting. Um, Filipino martial arts has this, fighting half the man, right? They call it that. Filipino martial arts, every time you'd go to the outside, they would favor the outside because it was called fighting half the man. You can only fight now my arm and this leg. I can't really punch you with this hand from here. It's a very good concept. The thing that makes Silat unique is Silat had a very, very unique way of going from inside to outside fighting. You would slap the hand down and you'd bring yourself inside or you'd slap the hand down and bring yourself outside. And in the process of changing that line, you're now controlling the line regardless of what they do. So you're bringing the arm down, you're on the outside line, you bring it back, you're on the inside line. And another thing I'll say about Silat, which is connected to that, is Silat has a very, very, very developed inside fighting game, far more than any Filipino martial art I trained. And I've trained a lot of Filipino martial arts, especially the empty hand aspect of Filipino martial arts. So what you get is this very complex understanding of the inside game of fighting when you're inside someone. And Randall always used to tell me, he's like, fight people face to face, get in their face. And why do you want to get in people's face? This was Randall's philosophy and this influenced my self-defense kind of approach greatly was because he always said, people know how to knock you out from far away. Just instinctively, we're born with it. We're tigers. We can knock people out from far away even if we don't know how to throw a good punch, just a crazy haymaker. And I always say someone could just catch you with a crazy punch. But when you get in someone's face, you take them out of their element. It's intimidating. So when they're the aggressor, and they start attacking, then bam, you're right in their face, throws off their game completely. Silat is built upon, and that's point three, entrances. How do I get from this range? Right here. That was a weird noise. So they're trying to get right into your face. That's the third thing that's very unique about Silat. Teaches you incredible entrances, closing the gap, and ways to get past the arm. I was talking about forearm awareness, now I'm talking about clearing arms. And again, that's something I've continued to use in my sparring. I've continued to use it when I teach self-defense, clear the arm, how to clear it, how to be aware of it. These are all translatable things. Again, I'm going to talk about the negatives of Silat, but I'm still in the positives. But some of the negatives will have to do with how complex it is. And sometimes that doesn't necessarily translate directly into self-defense. The fourth thing. So what do we have? We have far arm awareness. We have that center line understanding of kind of crossing the line going from inside to outside fighting. And then we also have clearing, closing the gap. These are all three incredible skills. I'm gonna jump into the fourth. There's so much good in Silat. And I know there's gonna be some people out there who just wanna bash it, but I'm sorry, thinking about it now. I didn't think I'd come in this video being like, there's so much amazing, but there really is, there's a lot of good stuff. So the other thing that Silat gives you, which is so unique in my experience to other martial arts I've trained, is not only closing the gap, but the continued motion into a takedown. The way you train is the way you fight. You look at guys who box and then go into the UFC, what they often lack, even if they train grappling or they train kicking, is the transitionary aspect of fighting, which is how do I go from striking into a takedown, right? You look at a wrestler, sometimes they're amazing at shooting in, they're amazing at other things, but, but you see this little breakdown in the gap of how they've trained because they train striking and wrestling different. They've never trained them really as a cohesive system. That's not how they came up. They came up just grappling. A boxer comes up just striking. A Muay Thai guy comes up just striking. Another example of a very good system that from day one teaches you transitionary fighting is Sanda or San Shao. Because San Shao is taught with the intention of I'm going to strike you and then I'm going to take you down. And a lot of those guys have beautiful transitions because they're brought up that way in their martial art to be able to just shoot in on you as they're striking you. And they understand that transitionary phase. And I always say, big lesson here, fights are won in the transition. People are very good when they understand their range. They're not very good 
when that range is coming in and out of out of their distance. In other words, if you fight a again, fight them in their face kind of concept, or if you're a striker, take them down. It's really in those moments, even when I'm training jujitsu, where it's a transition. I'm not quite in side control. I'm not quite past the guard, but their knees coming in and then I catch them with an ankle lock or whatever it is. It's in those moments where the, the fight is happening and it's a little more chaotic. So that's something that Silak gives you amazing. They have these sneaky little sweeps and where you put your feet and how to trip people. I have a great video on this I posted years ago. I'm gonna include little kind of shots of it here, but if people wanna see it, I'll repost it, so just request it. And it's, uh, it's really, really, really fantastic. The understanding of the body mechanics on how to sweep people, how to trip people, how to be annoying, kind of putting your shin in a place where it's gonna drop the guy is, is very unique. And you don't find that again, that kind of foot play. I'm sure there are some Kung Fu's out there that do it because I've seen it in Kung Fu. But outside of that, I haven't really seen systems that use it in this kind of cohesive way and understanding of body mechanics and the kind of, I guess the word is kinetic, the kind of kinetic movement of how a body works. See, like guys have that incredible. So uh, I would say those are the main, 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 main things that really make Silat an addition, a great addition to any martial art you're training. And forgot the last one. This is the last one, I promise. Relaxation. Silat gives you this, man, Randall could just like hit concrete floors with his palms like this, and you would feel like the floor was vibrating. And when he hits you, he would hit you with like this force that would shockwave through your body. There was a time where Uncle Bill came to do a class at our place and he hit me in like in the lower stomach, the lower abdomen. And I had like blood come out because and he didn't even do it hard. He just kind of had, had this ability to strike into your body. Like Randall would hit the bag and it looked like the bag was just going to snap. It didn't even move. It looked like it was going to snap. So the, the relaxation and the smacking, especially, and you develop this kind of heavy conditioning because you're always hitting the, your arms. There's always this heavy hit. And I remember when I go fight other martial artists, I would smack their arms and they would tell me, oh man, you're, the way you're like parrying my hit is causing me pain. And these, are, these were good fighters and I was able to just parry them and smack them in the arms. Smack, if you smack someone in the face on the ear, it messes them up. Silat gave me that, I think, better than any martial art, that kind of heavy smack. And it's an incredible ability. It's like this wave smacking ability that you learn to just be relaxed and you move faster from it also because it gives you the ability to just kind of let your body be loose, your shoulders be loose. And then when you get hit, you move with it better. So relaxation is a huge benefit in fighting. It's something that Silat will give you. They're not rigid. They're not like this kind of old school approach, karate approach to hard block. It's, it's all very heavy smack, light and relaxed. They called it monkey paw. Randall used to always say, it's like, act like a monkey. He would try and get us to act like monkeys and wave our arms around and smack the ground and stuff. And it looks stupid, but it translated to fighting. All that aside, I'm gonna add one last thing that's a positive. Ay, yeah, yeah. this is the video that I'm gonna look like I'm sucking up to a martial art, but I'll get into some good negatives. So where the last positive I'd say is Silat is the only martial art that I saw and have ever trained that from the ground kind of got you an awareness of like elbowing the legs, which was a weird thing. There was a lot of leg elbowing in Silat, including into takedowns. Like I'd be fighting you up here, elbowing you, and then I drop down and, and do something to your leg and take you down from there. But there's an aspect of being able to go from upper body to lower body. So the same way I said that there was a division here in my center line to outside to inside fighting. There's also the division across the center of the body to upper and lower body fighting. And it didn't mean that I had to be on the ground to fight your lower body. I could drop my base low enough, elbow you right on the inner thigh and take you down that way. And again, that was just something that you didn't see in other martial arts. And it really kind of jams the person up. And whenever I would fight people who do silat, we would spar in the class. And if you were training with someone and they just dropped and kind of elbowed the inside of your leg, it really caught you off guard. You're like, whoa, I'm not used to that. I'm used to people staying face to face. Nobody kind of wants to get low and just elbow me in the leg. And it would really catch me. So there you go. Those are my positives. Now the negatives. So what are my thoughts on Silat for the negatives? I think it, number one, it has a lot of, I guess the word is esoteric. I don't even know what esoteric means. I have to pretend like I do because it sounds like a word that I should know. Uh, but I'm gonna use that word. It's got a lot of movement that is unnecessary and complex. 
And it's got a lot of, it, and this could be a good thing for people or a bad thing. It has a ton of culture behind it, a ton of religion behind it. For me, luckily, the training we got, I didn't like infusing religion into my martial arts. And they didn't. They didn't make it about religion. But I know in Indonesia and certain schools, it's a huge part of the martial art. Um, but the movements I'm talking about, it's almost like there's there's like a dance approach to it sometimes. And uh, and showcasing your movements. And, and the forms are very showcasing. So it has a, a lot of that in it that you might not like. It's kind of the way people criticize the kata and karate. You could criticize that end of things in silat as well because there is that aspect of silat. It is, it is a traditional martial art. It does have those extra movements. It does have a lot of that stuff. And sometimes it looks a little bit ridiculous when you see people doing the stuff I talked about, like acting like monkeys and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, for some people that might be a huge negative. And I don't think it necessarily always is the best use of time. So. That is definitely one thing. Another thing I would say is from a self-defense application process. If you're doing a CLAT class, and I can't speak for every teacher, I think it's super, super, super important that you take the movements and where you see like a parry, check, elbow, turn that into one movement for yourself. Turn it into one movement. Like I always say, that's actually how I develop my system. And I think that if you look at systems like Casey fighting method, I don't care what people say. People think that's an original style. I love it. I love Casey. I think they're very, very good. But it's really just a modified version of what I've seen in Filipino martial arts, a Muay Thai high guard, you know, and or, uh, you know, in Muay Thai, you'll have this guard or this guard. And Filipino martial arts, same thing. We have this, we have this, we have this. And in Silat, you kind of have the same idea. You have a lot of, of these really, really complex movements, but they end up in kind of these same positions. The problem is that you have three steps before you get there. You'll parry, check, elbow. Now, that doesn't mean that that's not an effective way to train. It's just, again, this is where the criticism comes in. It's not gonna happen that way in real life. You have to simplify your training sometimes. Do situational training. Silat won't give you that typically. I'm sure there's some self-defense Silat schools out there, but a lot of them don't. A lot of them will teach you the complex style that they have. And if you look at uh, Belladiri, right? Sufyan Belladiri. Uh, it's a very beautiful system to watch. It looks incredibly effective, but look how many steps are being taken. Look how much complex motor function there is. And I always say this, when you're fighting somebody, you have to respond to a simple motor function, which is a haymaker, boom, you're, you're the victim here. Someone's throwing a crazy haymaker at you. You have to respond to it with an instinctive, simple motor function, which is hugging your head, which is covering up, whatever that is, just protecting your motor. That you won't get in CLAT. You're going to get the opposite. You're going to get someone teaching you to respond with complex motor functions. So it's going to be on you to take the movements in CLAT and adapt them to modern day self-defense fighting. You'll still get that far hand awareness. You'll still get the ability to now go from, I got into their face, I'm nice and close, to being able to attack in a more complex way. I always say this, go from being reactive, which is hugging your head, to being active. When you're active, it means now you're the aggressor, you've changed the scale. Now you can attack how you want. And when you can attack how you want, you parry that hand down, you elbow. Now you could do your parry check, elbow, clinch, into the trip, whatever it is. That's where you'll start pulling that stuff off. You need that first step to be able to be simple. So again, that's a negative for Silat. I'm trying to think of more negatives because I don't want to sound like I said so much positive and only two negatives, but I really feel like that's it. I mean, you're gonna have to supplement it with some kind of heavy ground style, I think, in my opinion. Uh, but we did do a lot of ground fighting in Silat. It's just rudimentary compared to any type of real grappling system. And I say this about any martial art that's not a specialized martial art for grappling, like sambo, wrestling, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, judo. You're gonna need something like that in almost any martial art you do to just complement what you're doing and it'll make you better. I don't think there's a one art answer to anything. So I don't know if that's a negative, but it's something to be aware of. If you're going to do sea light, yeah, you're going to learn some stuff on the ground. I'm not a huge fan of it. I've trained a lot of it. There's a lot of elbowing on the ground, which is good, but their understanding of body position on the ground is sorely lacking in my opinion. Um, and it's not a heavy ground based, Harry Mao is heavy ground based, but it's, it's still, again, it's not the same thing as going and doing Sambo or Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. So that's a negative. Do I think Silat is a effective self-defense style? Yes, I do. Again, Small adjustments will make it incredibly effective. Do I think Silat is a great system if you're already training another martial art to be able to grow as a martial artist? I can promise you if you train Silat, I don't care what martial art you're training, your understanding of human body mechanics will go through the roof. 
And you can look at it and say, it's too complex, it's stupid, it's this, it's that, I don't like it, I don't like their movements. So it will change you as a martial artist. It'll teach you all those positives I mentioned before. It'll teach you again to do what I just said, which is become active. Because again, their understanding of the hands and how they play with the hands is very unique and their understanding of trips is very unique. So a lot of information on Silat. I would definitely check out a class if there's one near you, you'll get a lot out of it. Um, and I think it's, again, a martial art you can train for many years until you're old, like me, ready to disappear into the infinite time, the void of emptiness. So go ahead, like and subscribe. Don't break my heart. Thank you for watching.